Hey, so hi everyone, and thank you for joining another farming community demo. I'm a farm and active developer within the farm project, and I'll be hosting the demo today. Let me know if there are some issues with the sound or uh, the screen sharing, and, and we will uh, fix it. Uh, so for any questions or comments, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, at the forming group chat or during the demo, you can also use the chat here on Google Meet. Uh, yeah, and this is our agenda for today's demo. We have, I think, yeah, we have three topics uh, for demos. One, um, more develop, developer-focused demo, and then uh, we have Avot with um, popular use case demo about Puppet. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll share a quick update from the community, and then we can move on to the rest of the topics. Um, so regarding the current uh, release candidate, we have Form 3.11, which is available available for testing. Um, there is a post in the community if you would like to see it um, with explanation of how to download everything. And of course, there is another post where you can submit your questions, comments, um, feedback, and so on. Okay. Uh, we'll Go back to the slides and yeah um for those who missed last community demo i would like to uh, to remind everyone what about the farming birthday event it's in uh, a month and a half from now and ethics are uh, hosting it so if you would like to join please reach out and there is a post in the community with all the details i think that's it for me yeah uh, so we can start with the demos uh, so Let's move on to our first presenter, who has two topics to share with you today. So Adam, whenever you're ready. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. All right, I'll start off by sharing my screen. Uh, sorry, I need to take the screen sharing from you. Uh, yeah. Let's click that in. All right, there we go. Hopefully, you should be seeing my Foreman instance right now. Uh, of course, it's uh, just for demonstration purposes, so the host names and so on are kind of funky. Uh, but the thing I want to talk about today is a report template that can be used uh, to provide uh, a list of hosts or inventory for uh, Ansible Tower. So there's this Ansible-Ansible inventory template, which is kind of long. <laughs> Uh, it looks at the hosts you have, gathers some information from them, and formats it into a shape that uh, Ansible Tower is then able to process. Uh, this template has been around for some time. And because it was it lived in Foreman itself, when it came to hosts' interfaces, it just took uh, the primary one and took its IP address and subnet from that. And the same applied to IPv6 address and IPv6 subnet. Now, uh, in remote execution, we have a concept of an execution interface, which means that, for example, if I look at this host, this host has one interface, which has the FQDN set and the IPv address set to loop back. And this is the primary interface. And then there is the other one, which uh, in this case is marked as remote execution or just execution interface. And when you run a remote execution job from Foreman, this is the actual interface or this is the address and uh, theoretically host name, that remote execution will use when trying to target the host. Now, you can probably see where this kind of starts to become an issue with regards to the template I started with. And that is the template for a long time only looked at the primary interface. So it would look at this one, which meant that if you run a job from Foreman, you would target this address or this interface. And if you run it, from tower you target another one and you might get a, a very different and strange results because of that so what we did uh we went into the report we made it remote execution aware so to speak 
And now the template first looks at the execution interface. And if there's any, and if it has an IP address, it takes the information from that particular interface. If there's none, it will fall back to the primary interface. So if I now just quickly generate it, I will skip all the fields we don't really care about. So no host groups, no host collections, just all the IPs and everything. And if I generate it and look at it, we should see, oh, come on, how do I make this bigger? Oh, there, zoom. Okay, if I zoom in a bit, we can see that all the hosts, except for the last one, have the 127.0.0.1 IP address set because they all of them only have the primary interface and this is the address set on it. However, the last one is the one I just showed you. This is the one which actually has a dedicated execution interface. And for this one, uh, the report template picked the other values, it picked the values from the execution interface. So we get the, the IP address from it, we get the subnet from it, and the same goes for IPv6 address and IPv6 subnet. Uh, just a little note, the way it works is that it checks if the interface has an IP address. So you can be sure that if there is an IP address and a subnet, that they come from the same interface. Uh, we took extra care to not, not allow mismatches because that would be really nasty if, for example, in here you would get an IP address from a one interface and a subnet from the other. So it's there. Uh, I, I really hope this can be useful. And I guess I can slowly move to the other topic I have, which again, takes us to remote execution. Uh, I'll pick a host and try to run, or no, different way. Uh, I'll take you to the job templates. Uh, at the core of remote execution are job templates, which is something that you can pass inputs into and it eventually gets rendered and then the rendered thing gets executed on your hosts. Uh, in here, I have a really, really simple template which just renders the single input in gets and then that's the thing that gets executed. It has a single input called script, which is marked as required. And it has a default value set. Uh, in the web UI, everything kind of works as you would expect. You can try to run the job. Uh, if I pick it in here, I pick my custom template with default input. And in here, I can see that the script input is already pre-filled. You can change it. You can reset it. You can run it. It should work. However, there was a mismatch between how the UI behaves and how the API and therefore how Hammer and Foreman and Civil Modules and Friends, how all these things behave. Because in the UI, the UI did a lot of work for you. The UI actually pre-filled the default value for, for you. And then you would just submit whatever the UI prepared for you. Uh, in Hammer, it didn't work this way. Hammer and API only took the inputs that you passed in explicitly. And therefore, if you didn't give in any, or if you didn't pass any input in, the job would just fail. It would yell at you, it would tell you that a required input is missing or that a value can't be blank, something along the lines of that. So of course, we went ahead and fixed that. So now if I switch over, uh, to my terminal, I have a little script which just executes a job and then waits for uh, an output from the job. So if I just uh, if I just run it and don't pass the inputs in, it will get executed and we will get the no input given, which is if 
I switch back, uh, where do I go? Templates, chip templates. Which is the output which comes from here, right? Uh, the default value is echo no input given, so it just prints no input given to the standard output, and that's what I see here. Uh, I can pass the inputs in if I want. Uh, so something else, for example, this should work as well. So now I'm explicitly setting the input and we can see that it was honored. Uh, I think I should be able to pass it to, to be null or empty to simulate the old behavior. And in this particular case, it will, yes, it will tell me the validation failed, that the, them, that the input value can be blank. Now, this is intended, the input is marked as required. Now I explicitly passed in an empty value, so it got rejected, which is all right. But if I don't provide the input at all, the default value gets filled in and it gets executed with the default value. Uh, it's a bit of a change in behavior if people were used to the old way, where if you didn't pass inputs, they were just blank and that was it. So a heads up, this is happening. Uh, it's going to be a new thing starting with Foreman 3.11. Uh, and yeah, I, I hope this, this will be useful to people. And yeah, that's it for me. I think I, oh, sorry about the cascade. I think I heard a notification in the chat. Yeah, there's a question. Okay, the question is, will we get that report upon updating our current form and instances, or is there a job that needs to be around to grab it similar to the provisioning templates etc? So once you update, you should get the new one. Uh, you shouldn't have to do anything on your own. You should get that as part of the upgrade. Great, thanks. Um, I guess no more questions. So we can move on to our next demo, the Container and Getaway Performance Improvements Conclusion by Ian. Awesome, thanks, Nafar. Let me, uh, got a small thing to share. Let me just, on the screen. All right, so I did a demo, I think about a, about a month and a half ago about performance improvements for the container gateway. Um, as a reminder, the container gateway is the container registry that lives on smart proxies. And we did some work to vastly improve the performance um, of concurrent logins, concurrent content pulling, just any kind of concurrent request, including concurrent smart proxy syncs, um, by switching from SQLite to Postgres as the essentially the authentication cache. Um, so we know what users have access to what repositories and what content is synced to the smart proxy, what container content. Um, and so I gave a couple updates about our switch to Postgres, but we are now concluded with that. Um, we have added support for this in the installer. And I'm showing here the example settings file. So some things that were changed, um, we now have a database connection string you can put in here. Um, if you want to, you can still use SQLite. However, the default will be to use Postgres here um, with uh, Unix sockets used for authentication. Um, and these are now considered legacy options on the bottom. We have the SQLite database path and then the SQLite timeout, which, what, which we added along, well, a while ago as an attempt to increase the SQLite performance. Um, and so what will happen when you upgrade is because the SQLite DB path will be here at the same time as the database connection string with a Postgres string, um, your content in the database is all going to be migrated 
from SQLite to Postgres, and then this file is going to be deleted. Um, so it's And it's just a one-way migration. We don't have a migration solution going from Postgres to SQLite. But if you have to do that for some reason, um, all you have to do is just resync your smart proxy, and the data will be back there. Um, fortunately, this data isn't anything that is a huge loss if it's lost anyway, because um, it's easily regeneratable. And this will all be available in the upcoming Catello 4.13, which is in its RC phase uh, very, very shortly. Um, the RC gem, I think, was already pushed. And we just need packaging to have in there. Um, however, the newest version of the Container Gateway, which is 3.0, is now available for you to try out. So if you do have any big environments with tons of container content and tons of hosts uh, trying to log in to the Smart Proxy Container Registry, you should see a great performance improvement here. And yeah, that is all for me. OK, great. Thanks, Ian. Uh, I see no questions. So moving on to our next topic, um, a developer-focused demo from Samir. So there is an RFC improved dev developer documentation in the farming universe. Hey. All right. So let me quickly share my window. Oh, yeah. All right. So. I just wanted to highlight an RFC that I was looking at. Uh, Open this yesterday. I wanted to highlight this and see if people had any thoughts. Uh, so a lot of our projects uh, and my pet peeve, Ketelo, uh, do not have sufficient developer documents. And there are other projects as well where it's very difficult to get the development environment set up. Once you have that uh, and you try testing your changes, there are not enough detailed steps. Uh, so I opened this. I was hoping to get some feedback on this and see if people had any thoughts. Uh, so for example, we have developer documents here. Let me see if I have a link. So, so for example, this so contributing is just hacking here so what i did here was try to upload this to chat gpt and asked it a simple question just to see if i would be able to do it and my question was how do i add a new package to form in js and the answer is like you just added to a package json whichever folder you want to add to but since it wasn't mentioned clearly in the contributing guide, so it would be difficult for either us or like you'd have to ask people who would know. Uh, so this was a simple example. So for Ketelo developers, I copied and pasted the entire Ketelo developer document we have. Bunch of links here. A lot of it is outdated. Uh, so. I was just looking at upgrading pulp, for example. And we mentioned a bunch of things which are no longer relevant. So we have Runcible here. So there are documents around upgraded pulp, but uh, we don't clearly define it in developer documents. So the resources might exist for such projects, but they live in different places. And it's not easy to find. Uh, Similarly, simple tasks, let me go back. So I uploaded the Catello developer documents to ChatGPT, and I asked it one question, which was to run React tests and how to do that. And it came up with the right answer, I guess, close enough, uh, because we had mention of that in the document. So I would assume humans go through the same process. But if I were to ask it how to set up a Catello dev environment, it takes me in a completely different trajectory because a bunch of that was in links. So if I were to look at Catello developers, uh, so it's 
it's still there setting up a developer environment for Ketello might not be very difficult but we probably want to add things like that for different projects and also define it clearly because that is one uh, thing that might help developers uh, and then there are other complicated things like if I were to ask I need to add a new task for some pulp action for example so we do not get a clear answer because none of that is documented anywhere so uh yeah this is all wrong it's all wrong it's all hallucination because we did not provide enough context in the catalog developer documents so things like that uh probably would help people get started on our projects and I think, yeah, so think about the projects that you work on and see if you can improve the developer documents and uh, like compile that somewhere, which is easy to find. Because a lot of times these documents exist, but they do not exist uh, where you would expect them to exist. So that is another problem. Uh, yeah, so looking for ideas on the uh, RFC as well. And that's about it. I had one question or a thought. Um, do you think, what do you think would be a better use of time um, trying to add more developer documentation on something like projects.theforum.org or improving documentation actually within the code, um, either with inline text or perhaps with something more fancy like, I don't know, class or better class or like method documentation. Right, so uh, it would depend. So for example, in Ketelo, uh, let's go to Ketelo because I've seen more, some stuff there. So if I were to go to Ketelo, we have uh, some developer documentation inside of these folders. So if I go to engines and go to Bastion Catalog, this has its own readme, this whole directory, and it explains some things like running tests, etc. So, uh, like this might help as well, like inside of your directories, just explaining a bit what it does and then linking to those in the parent level directory. So that is followed somewhere foreman itself uh so i saw a comment on the rfc already which was around geez yeah so foreman itself has a whole directory dedicated to this so developer docs so this is one option so depends on like how you go about it but at least somewhere we can point people to might be useful. And yeah, I think compiling it in a way that it's easy to find and also consistent across the project so you know where to look. So like Foman follows this developer docs, but we don't have this in other projects. So something, so finding one way to add all the documents across projects might be useful as well. Because having developer docs is one thing and being able to find those docs is also another thing. So both of those need to be solved. Yeah, I mean, having readme's within folders can be pretty hard to find. And inline code help might not reach the right audience as well. So perhaps doing something like Foreman could be good. And yeah, our, our doc, that's, that's a possibility, of course, too. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I was thinking of. I couldn't remember the name. Thanks. Um, so yeah, just some things to keep in mind. But if yeah, if Foreman already has a place they're putting their dev docs, perhaps Catello should follow. Um, I don't want to repeat the whole RFC discussion here, but I think it's not either one or the other. It's always a mix of them. Um, for example, I think on the former website itself, which I linked in RFC, we have the contributing guide. That's the way it started. 
Um, it also includes some general information about how we deal with issue trackers, CI, etc. cetera. Um, those things also um, map to multiple projects. So it's if you duplicate the every, every single repository, that's just a lot of um, duplicated content that you need to keep in sync. That's just going to be a bad experience. Um, our doc or yard, depending on which tool you prefer, um, in the repository itself, I think is a very useful thing. Um, and you also think, uh, I think you need some broader overview. How do the different things fit together? What's form itself? What's form and proxy? Um, how does it relate with um, with pulp? All those kind of things. How do they connect together? Um, I think that belongs more on some central location like the form website, um, because it's not one or the other. Um, and having that sort of overview to even know what space we're working in is very useful. Um, so it's going to be dependent. You need to link to different resources where they live and have some sort of consistent uh, way of approaching it. Um, but absolutely, we need to improve in this area. Um, it, it's just smart. Um, also, what I miss in Foreman is clear documentation on how things work. We have provisioning. There's a whole orchestration behind it. It's complex. And we don't have a clear diagram, or I couldn't find it if there's one, how that orchestration works. Um, what steps are applied? That's just um, hard for new people. Um, in, a, in a positive way, um, and I think I can share my screen, but probably easier, um, which people might not know about, but in the installer, um, we have CAFO that runs it. Um, CAFO actually has a pretty long readme, what it does, all the things, um, how it works, um, advanced topics, how it all works. Um, and that's, as you can see, a pretty long discussion about how the installer, installer actually works. But what is actually what I want to highlight, which makes things even e e more useful, there is a diagram with exactly the steps it takes, um, how the whole execution runs, which steps are taken, and the end, I think, yeah, it runs actually the, the old, and here's, for example, separate run puppet where it really applies it. And such diagrams, I quite often still refer to them um, because I want to understand what's going on, or a list of these are all the things I can hook into. Um, I think we should spend time doing the same thing for form and for um, just general workflows, because those are quite static and very useful for new developers. And um, yeah, I will leave that as a comment in the RFC as well, but uh, just wanted to mention it. I think those sorts of diagrams could be incredibly useful for complex content workflows that we have in Catello. I mean, to publish a content view, for example, there are so many form and tasks that get triggered um, and sometimes, depending on what kind of content it is, it's in a different order. Um, and like you said, this also is relatively static. It's been pretty much more or less the same for the past you know, five years. So I don't think the, it would be very helpful when people ask questions and we need to go back and you know remind ourselves how it works because this is not something you can keep in your head, just like, just like with the installer. <laughs> the Catello stuff is super complicated. And yeah, provisioning, I'm sure, is the same way. Um, yeah, so exactly. And, that. Yeah. Um, all those things, I think there's a big overlap between developers and advanced users who actually want to understand what's going on. These kind of workflow diagrams, they can benefit uh, both those groups at the same time. We should keep that in mind. It's not just APIs, etc. It's more of a general design. I guess no more comments. Uh, thank you, Sami, for this very important uh, topic. Um, I would be very happy to get back to it after you know thinking about it a little bit and coming up with uh, ideas. And we can definitely brain brainstorm or discuss it more. And yeah, uh, Avald, I guess you can continue sharing your screen because um, our next topic is actually a popular use case demo uh, about Puppet. 
be more specific configuration of hosts uh, through Puppet module. So whenever you're ready, feel free to start. Yeah, thank you. Um, so historically speaking, Puppet uh, and Foreman have been very tightly uh, uh, related. If you actually go back all the way back to the original Foreman database migration, they actually imported the Puppet database uh, schema, um, and that's where Foreman grew from as a Puppet dashboard. These days, um, they're more loosely connected. Um, for I think for the better, uh, we've done some horrible things like loading Puppet, the actual gem in Foreman itself. We thankfully no longer do that, but we still have a strong integration. Um, so what I have is a very, very simple demo. I just installed a nightly setup. Um, is it readable or do you need to zoom in? Um, I'll take that as a, it's readable. Um, I have just a single host. You can see it's out of sync. Um, what out of sync means uh, is, I don't actually find the host. Um, out of sync means Puppet normally runs every 30 minutes. And if there's no report, as you can see here, uh, I'll zoom in a bit. Uh, if there's no report um, for more than 35 minutes, um, it is a concert out of sync. Uh, and you typically want to know about it because usually that's a problem. Um, so let's start with uh, that part. So I want to just running Puppet itself without any class is going to be useless. Um, so what we're going to do is first install um, a simple module. Um, and there are better ways to manage it. Uh, this is just uh, a very, very quick example. Um, I'm just going to install our simple message of day module, which is usually the most trivial one. Um, once you have uh, modules on disk and you can see it's installing them in the modules directory um, under configure pub enc you have your environments and then you can load them um, you can import them from the smart proxy uh, internally the smart proxy will actually query the puppet server for the environments and all the classes that are available um, and that's what it's doing in the background now you can see it found um, new modules, Mesh of Day and Standard Lib. As you can see, it also installed those. Um, so we're going to update those. And once it's completed, you can see it's done. Um, and we can actually modify our host now. Um, you can see in Puppet, there's just a promo report from two hours ago. Uh, it's all not that interesting, but we're going to make it more interesting. So we're going to edit the host. Under the Puppet ENC tab, uh, you see the Puppet, uh, the Emerald Mesh of the Day class. Under that, we have a uh, some class that we're going to assign. So you can see the top level here is the module, and within the module, you have individual classes that you can add. Uh, so I've now the out of the uh, mesh of the day class. Um, if you have remote execution installed, you can actually run Puppet Apply uh, directly via remote execution. In this demo, I don't have it installed just to show it's a very basic installation. It doesn't require remote execution. Um, you can also wait if Puppet Agent is actually running, it will just uh, uh, automatically apply it over time. We're going to uh, Start the agent. I was we got to stop it um, to show the out of sync. Um, and syncing. And this part's usually a bit slower, but over time it will. The next time it already has all the, the actual types cached. Um, so it's now actually applying the changes and you can see there was a report, but this isn't really useful or easy to read. Um, luckily we actually sent the reports also to Foreman. So they are a bit easier to read. Um, you can see all the things that you saw on the console, um, but the relevant part is all the way at the bottom. Um, 
and actually actually the content changed. Normally you would actually see a diff, um, but I think because of the way I ran it, um, show diff is off. So sorry for that, that demo, uh, but Puppet can send diffs and you can actually uh, change it. So let's, uh, Uh, we're going to change the file just to force it. You can probably also reload it, but this also works. Um, and you start the client and you can see it's um, not syncing all the files again because it already has that. Um, so it made a corrective change because it knows it should have been correct here. Now we have um, a new report. You can see there's a new uh, report here. It, uh, it came from Puppet. Um, and if we zoom in, we actually have a very nice diff. There. And you can see um, we have both split because use unified um, and it showed you these files were and uh, these lines were added um, and because this is stored you can also look back into it um, there's filtering uh, on those reports uh, so if you only want eventful um, you can see these are the eventful ones uneventful ones you can also find those, but they're not interesting because nothing happened. Um, but that's what we call eventful. Um, and obviously, there's a host filter for a specific host. You can also do this across all your machines to uh, see what happened. Um, this is just searching that Foreman always has. Uh, and you can do some time range, for example, um, in some window. And um, that allows you to say, well, since yesterday, what happened in my infrastructure? Um, I've heard some um, some users, for example, they started the day with, okay, just show me reports what happened um, since yesterday. If nothing special happened, uh, everything's great. And um, otherwise we can investigate. Um, and this is because of the whole inventory, it's uh, a great overview. Um, now, if we go back to the dashboard, since Puppet ran, it should also be in sync. And we can see it's active. Um, active means it actually did something in the last run. Um, but it's, uh, it's now considered green. Um, and other things you can see if you go to the uh, uh, Puppet page, you can see the specific uh, things that applied. Um, we also have the ENC. Uh, this is how Puppet internally sends the data. So uh, we give a bunch of uh, data um, that for the Puppet actually queries from Foreman. Um, there's a bunch of parameters we set. Uh, all data that comes from Foreman itself, like what Foreman thinks the FQDN should be, what the host name, what all the, the context, the network interfaces. Um, and you can use all of these parameters in your uh, Puppet manifests. Um, the thing we changed uh, is the classes bit here. Um, and we can actually change that again. Uh, so we're going back to the uh, edit part. We're going to add more resources. Uh, so we are going to assign the standard lib manage class. Um, and actually, I forgot something. We first, we're going to make a parameter a configure role. Uh, so we have the manage class. And manage class has uh, one single parameter, create resources. Uh, we're going to make it overridable, which means that um, in different places you can override it. There's a certain order applied. For example, you can match on the on the host itself, on the host group, on the OS domain, all those kind of facts. Um, I won't go into de details here exactly. Um, but that's all there. You can also apply validators. Um, 
like we usually have with uh, all of our parameters. Um, there's also a special one called omit. Um, omit means you can override it, but there's no default. Um, and I actually like that uh, value the most. So usually I select it. Um, so if we go back to the host now, what we can do uh, is, um, oh, by the way, the parameters, uh, the gen uh, general host parameters like global params, et cetera, they also all show up. Um, so uh, these show up in the ENC. Uh, smart cross parameters are a bit more. So let's say manage. Uh, and we can override it here. Make it full screen since we worked out a bit more. And I'm just going to quickly look in the source code for the example. Yeah, um, so we're going to manage a file and we're going to just use the example uh, that we have here, for example. And that is we're going to ensure it's a file with a certain content. Uh, now, if we go to the ENC, you will see that in the end we have the um, uh, manage class. It sends, sets the create resource parameter, it sets a file. And if we now apply puppet again, it should create that file and actually manage it. And you can see it created uh, that file. Hello world is in there. Um, and again, all of this is um, now in a report. Um, I typically go to the host itself because I know which host I'm working on. Um, but you can also go um, to reports in general. Um, so here we can see um, the file was created and the report. So, as I mentioned, um, configuration manager reports is another way to find them. These are all of the different hosts that you can see. Um, that's just different ways to uh, access the same information. Um, and that's, I think, the, uh, the very brief overview. Um, there's a lot more that you can learn about. Um, we have on the form documentation, we have um, configuring host using Puppet. Um, uh, which has a lot more information on how to exactly use it and more powerful features. But I thought a quick demo uh, would be useful. Um, so this is um, what I wanted to show. I don't think there are questions. Um, so back to you, Nafar. Yeah, thank you, Eivald. This great demo. I don't see any questions as well. Um, yeah, feel free to ask us even after the demo. We are available in the form in the chat. And yeah, I guess I can quickly share the last uh, slide over it. Um, Let's see, my screen is visible. I guess I didn't share it um, properly. Anyway, uh, the next demo is in three weeks from now, as usual, on June 20th. And yeah, I guess that's it. Just thank you, everyone, for joining. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Thanks, all.